Hello, welcome everyone. I, Councilmember Hunt, call the November 8th, 2023 City Council Planning, Development, and Environment Committee meeting to order. I am here tonight, my name is Councilmember Hunt, and I'm here tonight with Council President Walsh and Council Deputy President Hall. And um, we have a couple items on our agenda, but the first item on our, on our agenda will be public comment. There will be multiple public comment opportunities at tonight's meeting. There will be a general public comment opportunity at the beginning of the meeting, or you can make comments after the presentation and council question and answer period on tonight's agenda items. Um, so at this point, I will check in with the city clerk if there is anyone. Um, I will note for the record that there are no, there are no members of the public um, in council chambers. And I will check in if there are any members of the public online that might wish to make a comment. Uh, Chair Hunt, we have no virtual attendees at this time. Okay, um, then I will just uh, note for the record that we welcome comments and you can submit comments at any time to city council at issaquawa.gov. And with that, we will move to um, our first item, which is actually the approval of the minutes. These are the minutes of the October 3rd meeting. I will note that there was a error that has been corrected um, on the attendance. It was Councilmember Hall in attendance, so that has been corrected. Um, there, there was also one thing that I, <laughs> um, there is one thing as well that I uh, noticed, which is that we discussed, um, there was a question at that meeting about parts of the um, comp plan elements that uh, were, the, the topic that was discussed was if it should go back to the PPC, but most of the things that we discussed, we ultimately did not recommend uh, needed to be looked at further by the PPC Planning Policy Commission. Um, and so I've, I've just recommended in that case that we separate those out just to make it clear, because there, there were only two pieces um, that were actually recommended to go back to. Planning Policy Commission. So um, with those changes, which I understand uh, can be made, um, we can approve the minutes. Is there any other uh, comments or corrections or anything? Okay, then I move to approve the minutes of the October 3rd meeting with the corrections that were mentioned. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes. Thank you. And with that, we will go to our first regular agenda item, which is ID 1494, Diversity of Housing Types, Policy and Regulation. And this will be presented by Kristen Leeson, our long range planner. Kristen, take it away. There we go. Good evening. I am Kristen Leeson, senior long range planner. And yes, we are here to talk about diversity of housing types and our work plan. You may recall this has come up just kind of on the tip of things a couple of times, and we brought it to the Committee of the Whole on October 9th, and it was decided then that it needed just a little more attention than it, we were going to be able to give it there. So we brought it back to you all. There we go. So tonight we want to have you review our housing diversity, condominium development, inclusionary zoning recommendations from Eco Northwest. That was done to, they were looking to help us implement strategies six, seven, and eight from the housing strategy work plan. Then we'll review the proposed 2023 to 2026 housing work plan. And then we would love for you all to provide guidance for us for our next steps. So some of the things that we're looking at are either uh, Pursue the proposed work plan as presented to you all tonight, or reprioritize the proposed work action items, or maybe remove some of the proposed action items from the work plan. I'm going to go over some of the recommendations quickly, just as a reminder. These came from Eco Northwest. Strategy number six is for inclusionary zoning, and that is to expand it in central Issaquah and, if possible, outside of central Issaquah. And they came back and said, you can't expand it until you fix, fix the current problem. So their recommendations were to an analyze and calibrate inclusionary zoning requirements, which may involve things like increasing the required area median income and decreasing the required number of units. Um, structured parking requirements have been an issue. The development bonus program and the multifamily tax exemption program, which would be actually adopting a program. 
for either central as far as citywide. For strategy seven, they, we actually haven't talked about this one much because there isn't much that the city can do as far as, as development regulations go. This was the trying to find, trying to eliminate deterrence to condominium development. One of their recommendations was to do a uh, pioneer project program as an incentive to build condominiums, and we're already working on a pioneer project program. And then perhaps allow some flexibility in standards combined with the multifamily tax exemption, which we'll be looking at through other projects, or through other research. Lastly is strategy eight, which was housing diversity. We wanted to get more housing diversity citywide, and we looked specifically at multifamily zones, not at single family zones at that time. So one was consider incentivizing courtyard housing and multifamily high, and I've heard, no, um, that, that wasn't a favorite so far. Um, and then reevaluate impervious uh, coverage limits, specifically in multifamily high, and that's because right now the impervious surface maximums are 50%. And so go looking at parking that's required with that and potentially structured parking, they wanted us to re-look at that. Incentivize cottage housing in lower density zones. That'll be covered through House Bill, implementing House Bill 1110. Then uh, reevaluate minimum parking requirements and reevaluate re re all parking requirements for micro units, especially the structured parking requirements. So, Housing Bill 1110, I mentioned, is the middle housing, which was adopted in 2022 by the state. It has to be implemented by 2025. It requires that we allow up to, or that we allow at least two lots per, two units per lot, up to four units per lot, as long as one is affordable, and at least six, they have to have at least six of nine middle housing options to be allowed. And looking at that, we didn't think it was gonna be that difficult, but the further we get into it, the more we realize how much work is involved in that. The last thing that's included in our work plan proposed work plan is our items that came up from the Title 18 update. It's on the future to-do list. One was the parking analysis, which we have funding to do, and we'll be doing that one. Another one is best practices for housing diversity, and last was to reevaluate multifamily uses in additional zones, which will be handled through 1110. So that's sort of where all the work comes from, where all the recommendations are coming from, and what our draft work plan has, how it's been developed. So looking at our work plan, it's a little small, uh, but we have the comprehensive plan update, which will take place. It has to be completed by the end of 2024. We're hoping that the bulk of that is done by June of 2024. We're also currently working on our Pioneer project, which we hope to have that work done by the end of Q1 of 2024. Then we received a grant, a $75,000 grant, to do the middle housing standards <coughs> update. <coughs> Excuse me. Half of that, half of the money has to be spent by June of 2024. The rest of it has to be spent by June of 2025 when those amendments have to be completed. So there's a very strict timeline with that one. The others came from all of the different strategy recommendations and House Bill 1110. Those include the multifamily tax exemption, looking at adopting that program, inclusionary zoning, development regulations, impervious surface height, density, development bonus program and the parking strategy. Following that, we'd like to do, once we get that into place, what happened part of it this time is that we did our housing strategy work plan and then realized we couldn't do a lot of what was on there because the regulations weren't in place or it wasn't gonna work. So we'd like to get these things in place and then update our housing strategy work plan. Now, this was originally supposed to be updated in 2022, but then, we were doing our comp plan update and we were, you know, the state was coming out with new regulations and we said, why would we do the housing, why would we do that now when we don't know what our policies are gonna be yet? So that's the reason for waiting on that one until 2025. And then lastly would be a central Issaquah plan update that will be you know, 13 years in the making, 14 years in the making by the time we get to that. Also running with that will be the concurrency update, uh, the light rail planning efforts that are actually they've started and then neighborhood plan development, potentially for 2026. So as far as what we would do from here, after we have our discussion, we would come back to this committee in early, 20, early 2024 with a scope of work for each of the action items that are on our work plan. So that's, that's all I have. It's just back to 
if you like the work plan the way it is, if you would like us to try and reprioritize, or if you want to remove some of the items that are on there. Great, thank you. We can start with questions. Um, and I know some questions were emailed in, so that's always great. Um, do we have any questions at this point? Councilmember Hall. Um, thank you. I, by the way, I love the work plan timeline graphic that you have there. It's very, it's very helpful to visualize. So whoever was responsible for that, thank you. Um, the ones that are planned for Q3 of next year, the majority of the work plan stuff, are those prioritized in any particular order there? They're not. Okay. Right now we feel like they, they are so intertwined with each other that we left them as one. Okay. Um, and I had asked a question about the Pioneer Project earlier via, via email, and I don't know if I was clear in my question. I'm, I'm just curious if, because we considered it and dedicated staff time to it, did that have any impact in terms of when we are considering these things in the timeline? No, thankfully, uh, Jen Davis-Hayes is doing most of the work on that one, and we're just helping her, so it'll be just the reverse. We would do most of the work here, and she would help us out there. I have a general question about, um, so we, we are being asked to uh, evaluate this timeline and make changes, but what's the, you know, given that there are, is some sequencing here that's uh, necessary, what, what's the scope of what's possible in terms of actually changing this timeline? I suppose it depends on how we change it. Mm -hmm. So, so for instance, if we were as a as a group to recommend to council that we wanted to prioritize one of the pink, you know, the various shades of pink items, um, and then deprioritize a different one, could we move one up to the beginning of twenty twenty four and move one, and then to compensate, move one like later, or is that not really? If is it like? prioritize within this time frame, but the time frame is kind of set. I, th I think it's doable. Um, the only thing that really has a, the only two things that have very critical timelines to them are the comp plan and the middle housing standards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Deputy City Administrator Snyder. I just want to add to that. Um, as we've talked about this internally, uh, as we t and then we talk about some of those kind of pink items, MFTE, inclusionary zoning, uh, uh, the impervious surface and height density, et cetera. Um, we have realized that a lot of those are kind of interdependent levers to pull that all affect the financial um, viability of a project. And so that's why we're suggesting them to be considered together, because if we consider them separately, um, uh, policy on one will necessarily affect the other. Uh, so that's why we wanted to kind of take it in as a whole. Now that said, if council wants to reprioritize this and move uh, one of those things up, we can certainly do that. But I just wanted to provide a little extra information about why we're considering grouping those together. Another question? Okay, Council Member Walsh. So I'm trying to tease out what a conversation on the HB 1110 missing middle housing would look like without also talking about impervious surface and height and density and parking and all of that. So in this current plan with two quarters of that work plan happening ahead of the pink stuff, what is that sense? Because if half of the money has to be spent by that June 2024, I would assume some sort of substantial conversation is planned for the first half of 2024. But how do we do that without also touching upon these other areas? Mm -hmm. 
thinking. <laughs> And I think Minnie's going to jump in. Some of the some of the work can be done by staff. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Good question. I think um, our thought process on the House Bill 1110 at the time is because of the upcoming deadline, we will do what the House Bill requires us to do in the, this first go. But it wasn't our attempt to redo all our development standards as part of that work. Uh, we would look at design standards because you can't really make them different for single family versus a duplex or a triplex. So the focus more for 1110 was going to be coming up with a feasibility report of what does it mean for Issaquah. It's, it's, you know, as you start digging into it, it, it kind of gets very complex in terms of um, six of the nine uh, options that you can choose. What does that mean? Um, and things like that, that we would go through analysis of that with this grant funding, figure out what, what it means, which neighborhood you know, we need to kind of figure out because the critical areas are and, you know, things. So a lot of feasibility analysis and then have a focus on the design standards um, with this effort because of the deadline is so, you know, June of 2020, six months after the comp plan. So it wasn't our attempt to look at all the development standards uh, as part of that effort. Uh, I mean, it's just physically not going to be feasible to look at all of our development standards um, without, you know, even things like impervious surface is a complex thing because we have aquifer recharge areas, we have other things, so one thing has a trickle effect on others. Um, so it's not just a numbers game of like, you know, in order to make it work, what will work. Um, but then the other three things for the housing that we prioritized here, the pink items, were really teasing out from what council had given us direction of prioritizing the, the items for uh, the Title 18 update, but also uh, through Eco Northwest. I mean, there were a lot of action items from Eco Northwest, and so things we were already going to do and things that made sense to b uh, bundle up, which was inclusionary zoning, development density bonus, and MFTE. So those are the three we teased out of Eco Northwest to, and with a focus of uh, you know, in central Issaquah, because uh, that's where majority of the growth is designated for the city and getting prioritizing those elements. Um, obviously, they would apply citywide, but th that was our thought process in terms of what we already were, ta you know, had the items to do and, and really the bandwidth uh, with one and a half FTE to, to do this right, because um, we could open it up and, and not, you know, uh, be too ambitious in our in our goals. That that's sort of our thought process. Yeah, I I appreciate the concept of you know we need to do a feasibility study to mm -hmm. better understand and looking at the six of nine and I think those are all very important. I get concerned with much like you can toss out an MFTE program and not have all of the other things involved that make it successful. Well, we can say that you can do missing middle housing, but if we're not going to also look at impervious surface and parking, then I think we have a lot of blockers there. So I will be interested to see how we talk about how we effectively address HB 1110 sure. um, and not just add it in the code and still have things that are blocked. Yeah, I mean, the bill has limitations in terms of the parking and other things, so we would definitely, you know, follow the law there um, in terms of what that is. But, um, yeah, I think that all of that scoping of what understanding, the first step one, understanding all the nuances of the bill, get the guidance from Department of Commerce that's coming away related to that. So I think that all needs to get lined up, and then we figure out what's doable uh, because of the deadline. Questions? Okay. Um, I'll check. Uh, I'll note there are no members of the public in the audience. Is there anyone online that at this time might want to make public comment before we move into our discussion? 
Chair Hunt, we do have an online attendee, but they have not indicated a desire to speak. Okay. Um, well, maybe I will just give them a minute in case they do, um, and then we will move on to our discussion. Nope. All right, then uh, we will move into our discussion. Um, so um, I think it would be great to put the questions that you have for us back up if you can do that. I think the first one was, okay. So feedback needed about whether to pursue the proposed 2023-2026 work plan to implement housing goals as proposed. Um, and then the other, the next one is also about prioritizing the work plan action items or removing action items. Council President Walsh. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just said it. I really care about the depth that we go into for the missing middle HB 1110 um, conversation. And so I, I think we can probably do it effectively with this timeline, just recognizing that to have an effective conversation on that, I think you're absolutely right. Parking maybe doesn't need to be a huge part of that because it's already required the limitations in the bill. Um, but I do have concerns about the development regulations portion um, and how that relates to HB 1110. So I would want to make sure that those are addressed together, I think. Um, I th I think the grouping of the MFTE, inclusionary zoning, and the development bonus program makes a lot of sense in parking in with that because, as the Eco Northwest report said, we can't effectively do an MFTE and inclusionary uh, zoning program without making some adjustments to that. So I guess my only feedback would be I think the development regulations may want to be more highly paired with the missing middle housing standards um, and just be kind of certain about that. The next point I have in looking at this is thinking, gosh, we're going to go back to the housing strategy uh, work plan update already in 2025. It feels like we've been doing a lot of housing stuff. Um, so I guess I would have to go back and look at that to get a better sense whether I think we're ready for an update or whether we need to see what some of the impacts are of these changes. Because I think I would be a little bit concerned that if I'm trying to analyze gaps at that point in mid-2025, I would be pointing backward to the changes that we just made rather than really having an assessment of what do we need to do going forward. Um, so I'm interested to have an effective housing strategy work plan, but I just want to make sure that we have enough look back period to really have an understanding how some of these things affected. So those are my thoughts. Um, would you like to go next or I can go? Okay. Um, so the, the First thing I had comments on is a little bit outside of the scope of this, but um, we did in our last meeting have uh, a brief discussion about the cottage and, a, and apartment, uh, cottage and courtyard apartments. Um, I went back and looked at the, um, I went back and looked at the Eco Northwest report and it says, to paraphrase, there's no inherent drawback in allowing those. And I think, um, so that was the first thing. That one seems like it might be good to make some progress in at least allowing things because right now in our area that we expect to be where we will have light rail and we will have um, more transit in the future and it will be more dense in the future, more walkable, et cetera. Right now we really don't have any housing, any residential. And so it seems to me like, yes, this isn't what we ultimately imagine would be there with the with the higher density that would promote that walkability, but if there, I, I guess I agree with that Eco Northwest statement. There's no inherent drawback to allowing it to see if developers would would build that if it were attractive for some reason. Um, so sort of like micro units, 
we have not yet seen them, but we added them and there may be developers who are interested in building that because that's what they build or for whatever reasons they might have. So um, that was one thing I just wanted to revisit um, before we before I moved on. Um, I don't know if you if we have any comments about that because that has been sort of sounds like kind of taken off the work plan. Um, and so I just wanted to revisit if if we actually think that that's not something we could just add to the uses table essentially to follow one piece of this eco northwest uh, and get get moving and allowing it. I mean, I think there were two recommendations in strategy eight. One was allow cottages and courtyards in multifamily medium and multifamily high. And the other was consider incentivizing courtyard housing in multifamily high. Um, I think I don't generally have a problem with the idea of cottages and courtyards in multifamily medium. Uh, my concern is really in the multifamily high aspect because of the loss of that space being used for things like single room occupancy or something that would be a little bit more de dense and I certainly wouldn't want to incentivize it. Um, so generally I don't think it's a direction that I would want to push forward on um, but I would be open to the idea as long as it didn't include incentivizing. Okay, yeah. Again, I, I raise it because there are many com very complicated pieces of the Eco Northwest uh, recommendations that involve considering trade offs between adding or you know changing the inclusionary zoning and changing the parking and changing FT F MFTE and then you know all these trade offs and then that one it seems like. It was it was something we could act on, which I probably could consider. I will just say again, I I think there are downsides to uh, having. It's not as bad as allowing single family housing in a multifamily high zone, but I think it does potentially get us less density in areas that we are focusing on density, so. I'm sorry. Staff clarification here. Y yes, thank you, Chair Hunt. Uh, Kristen. Thank you. So as a reminder, we actually, at the beginning of this year, middle of this year, amended the land use code to allow cottage housing and courtyard housing in the multifamily high and multifamily medium zones. The Eco Northwest report was to incentivize these two uses in lower density zones. And so House Bill 1110 requires that we allow six of nine types of housing and cottage housing will likely be one of the types that would be allowed there. In the lower, in, in the lower density. density zones, yes. Okay, so then it, it would be about incentivizing, which we are thinking we... Well, but there's a difference between incentivizing a courtyard and cottage housing in multifamily high, which I think would be a negative aspect because it doesn't get us the density, um, versus incentivizing it in a what would currently be a single family zone. Um, and maybe it's not even incentivizing, but just saying that's one of the six of nine middle housing elements that are allowed in um, as a way to satisfy the HB 1110. Okay, so then my, my thought is that we should uh, consider allowing, allowing it to, as a type um, just to see if it gets built, <laughs> basically similar to the micro units, um, but I, do we, is it currently allowed in the lower density areas? No, no, it is not. Okay. And so that would be part of the conversation on HB 1110, because we would have to decide which of the nine 
would are interested in allowing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and that starts with Q1. Okay. All right, then I guess we table that until okay. we get to that point. Okay. Um, all right. Then, okay, I'll get back to the questions. So the first question is pursue the proposed work plan. Um, it seems to me that the two things um, in the Eco Northwest that really jump out are one is of all the cities that were on there, everyone else just had a yes multifamily tax exemption in their comparison, and ours had a very limited, um, and, and everybody else had yes. So that one seems like it's something we kind of know we need to look at from the report, I would, I would say. Um, and that it does set us apart, inclusionary zoning, for example, we have an inclusionary zoning program, it's not delivering the results that we hoped, but we do have it, and so do our neighboring cities. Um, and then the other, the other thing that stands out to me is our parking, um, that seems like that. There's a big cost, or a big, um, a big impact to developers on the feasibility based on the parking, um, and so, if I, I know that everything is interrelated and there are lots of levers, but it seems like to me, um, MFTE and the parking are really like big, we have a, a big ways to go to understand how to change our code and to get from where we are now to where we need to be on those two. Um, so I would, I would propose that we consider prioritizing those, I think we're also gonna be thinking about the development regulations as part of the middle housing strategy overall and thinking about incentives and bonus and stuff. Um, but again, like those two seems like from the report, we have a long ways to go. Um, the other interesting thing from the report to me was that we have, uh, we have developed affordable housing in Issaquah at somewhat comparable levels to our neighboring cities, but the most, but most of it has been through development agreements, which is completely different than the neighboring cities. So our regular, our regulations just in the code have not allowed us to get that affordable housing. It's been through development agreements. Um, and so again, like, seems like those things where we're very different than our neighboring cities, which would be MFT, and I, I believe the parking is a big one too, um, that we could prioritize, consider prioritizing those. So I'll put that forward. Um, but other than that, I think, you know, these are definitely the things we need to look at, the right content, and that would be consideration for our prioritization. So maybe I don't understand. Um, I thought we couldn't, you mean pull things earlier? What do you mean by prioritize? And if, if you'd like to move things up earlier in the timeline or move things back. I mean, I'd Love to move everything up, uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, given staff capacity, I mean, given the capacity that we have to actually move forward, the way that you had presented it earlier in the presentation, saying, "Let's get what we have to do out of the way first, and then we can have these broader discussions about really what does eleven ten mean here in Issaquah, and how do we implement the vision also of the plan and all, and uh, the Eco Northwest report." That makes sense to me. Um, I agree that MFTE and parking in particular are big ones, and I think we've said that here in this committee too, and MFTE also very important because I think it, we really need to dig more into the impact we have on our revenues also. Um, so that's a much larger discussion than just um, affecting some sort of outcome out in the built environment. So, um, and then with parking, I couldn't remember if this was in the report too, um, looking at differences across the region. You know, so much of the problems with parking is because of the high water table here in Issaquah too, and so it's hard to, to build lower. So I'm, I'm curious how we should think about our differences in parking across the region when potentially the way we should be thinking about parking is different here in Issaquah or somewhere else on the east side. Um, anyways, those are, I guess, not super germane to, to the work plan development, but I, I do think that the proposed work plan as it is now makes sense just given staff capacity and given our ability to actually move things through and given the deadlines that 
that you've mentioned, we're able to pull out some of these things that we think are going to take longer, like MFTE, and also the things that council, the full council has um, described as very important, like the parking study, that would be great. Well, and also I think it would be helpful, I assume, to deprioritize things if we're prioritizing things. And so earlier, uh, Council President Walsh was talking about housing strategy work plan update. I think I agree. So one, one thing is that we had the housing strategy work plan fairly recently. I recall working on it when I was on Planning Policy Commission, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the Eco Northwest study is a good assessment, at least of several elements of it, and kind of a refresh and market analysis. And um, so I think that could maybe, so I think I agree that we could consider moving that item a little bit later. Um, and also to get the results of whatever is implemented with the missing housing standards update. I think that's a good point, and I'm interested what staff has to say about potentially delaying that. I, the only thing I would see missing is um, when we update or develop like a strategic plan like this, it has lots of touch points for the community for input. So that would that would potentially be one thing I would see, I would see missing if we did delay. But anyways, I'm just curious what we think about potentially deprioritizing the update to the work. I think the point about having an opportunity to see how these regulations work is is a good point and worth taking and perhaps moving it out a little bit just to see what kind of effect it has and also if house bill 1110 has had an effect and then we also have 1220 which is the emergency housing you know because the housing strategy includes emergency housing as well so and regular market rate housing so i i don't think it's as long as others Agree with me. Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea to move that out. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't, don't think there's any urgency. The only thing I would probably add to the conversation is the housing strategy doesn't really uh, <clears throat> go into very much detail about how we're addressing homelessness or how we're addressing the lower income brackets that we're now having to address in the comprehensive plan. And so that's one thing that might be in consideration of why we would want to do the update sooner, but um, to the part of the discussion tonight is as we're looking at the development regulation and the impacts of a lot of the tax we've taken on from the work plan. Also, we'll play into a lot of time to uh, update as well. Um, yeah, great. Um, I think the only thing I would add is, um, you know, we don't have to make that decision today because I think that's a little bit ways out. So we can check in later on where we stand on it. Um, after all of this <laughs> other work is done. Um, but the countywide planning policies, uh, you know, the requirement for us to get certification of a comp plan and accountability of plan for and accommodate for lower um, AMIs uh, is going to get folded into our uh, comp plan policies. Um, and then we, when we start looking at inclusionary rezoning and MFTE, those are the tools that the local jurisdictions have to advance that those policies. And so I think some of that work will occur as part of those, uh, when we look at inclusionary zoning and MFTE related to those goals and policies that will get embedded in the comp plan. So in terms of actually updating the housing strategies plan, you know, it's not like we haven't done anything on housing. There's a lot of work that has happened between Eco Northwest, which brought in the filter of market feasibility which wasn't part of the housing strategies. It was more about the goals and, you know, desires for the council. And so uh, that's one thing, but how do we make it happen is sort of what ECO's uh, task was to help us figure that out. Um, so I think we we, don't, we can push that out. I'm sure there'll be other bills coming our way to, to work on POD bill and whatever is in the works. Um, so, sure, we, there's no... Desire no part. Yeah. President Walsh. Yeah. Um, since I'm on the growth management planning board and we're talking about the um, regional growth centers, is the central ISQA plan update timing made to kind of work within that recertification process, or is there anything we're going to need to 
prioritize into 2024 for that. I don't think we need to prioritize anything into 2024 for that now. Yeah, not yet. Um, but yes, when we redo the central Issaquah plan, a lot of that will be geared toward the regional growth center and the and the light rail and the transit oriented development and everything that's coming into that area. Um, and I guess also just when we come back in 2024, we kind of define the scope of work for each of these items too. I'd like to get a sense of where are those touch points with for community input and in this process. So I think my one of the feedback items I had was um, it's very difficult to have the missing housing, missing middle housing HB 1110 conversation without also really talking about the development regulations that would hold back the feasibility of some of those uh, housing types. So I'm not sure how people feel about more of a direct pairing of those so that that starts at the beginning of 2024 or whether that feedback is even really necessary since it does say HB 1110 not down there. So uh, my mm -hmm. understanding from this conversation this evening though is was more that like the piece of development regulations that is directly applicable to that HB uh, 1110 and the missing middle in particular will be discussed and contemplated you know during that gray box where we're discussing middle housing standards but then the bigger picture of development regulations as they relate to the entire strategy eight is you know with the part of the timeline which i think is okay and i guess part of probably part of why i think that is because i think the multifamily tax exemption and the parking are the biggest of the think timeline items that need to be um, that, is that all accurate as far as the development regulations with HB 1110? It is. Um, yeah, we need to look at sort of design standards and how you're going to fit cottage housing into a single family lot and that kind of thing. But first, we need to figure out where it can even go, you know, because you do have all, it says, you know, it, it, areas with critical buffer, critical areas mm -hmm. and their buffers are not included. They're excluded from this. Well, we need to figure out, first of all, where are those? So. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done first, and then, yes, you're accurate with development regulation. Um, okay. Well, you have some feedback. Do you, is this clear enough feedback for, you know, making some priorities? Or should we try to be more clear? I just have one quick question, if I may. So when, yes. when we're prioritizing, say we're prioritizing moving, the parking strategy already starts in 2024, but if we're prioritizing MFTE, does that get moved up earlier in 2024 as well, or does that start still, or do we move other things back? Which, which way are things going? It's a good question. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more uh, about, like, definitely to achieve an effective MFT program, according to the Eco Northwest, we need to look at parking. But I think they also said we need to look at development regulations as well. So I'm trying to get at which of those pink items absolutely has to be paired together in order to have an effective conversation, or is it really all five of them? So I think multifamily tax exemption doesn't really get tied to the parking. That's more of a standalone. That's, um, do you guys see it that way? It's, it's not tied to parking. Yeah, multifamily tax exemption. Yeah, That's they just, both have an impact on the finances. Right, they both have an impact, but tied. parking doesn't impact MFTE, MFTE doesn't impact parking, so that's sort of a standalone. But parking and impervious and density bonus, those all have impacts on each other. Because if you reduce, say, structured parking requirements, then not as many people have to use density bonus, and then it infects 
that affects inclusionary and so on. Yeah, you know, one of the things we learned um, through our conversations with Arch is um, it's the bundle of incentives together that makes or breaks a project. So, you know, we, we don't want to create regulations that then don't result in actual outcome. Uh, so recalibrating it so that actually is beneficial and we actually get affordable housing. So if from an, if the inclusionary zoning and MFTE are definitely tied together because you're going to use one as a as an incentive to get your policy objectives, whatever the city desires in their goals and policies. Those are the gifts from the city and they can be used uh, one way or the other. Um, the parking, like uh, Kristen said, impacts the development feasibility sig most significantly, according to Eco Northwest report. Um, but it, it, it's not; you know, it, it's 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 another incentive you can have in your bundle of incentives. So in some in some instances, it could be well for affordable housing, you get X amount. Of, I think we already have reduced parking requirements and things like that, but but only only for the purposes of if you want to use some parking you know, giveaways for reduced parking and such for a specific policy objective, whether it's to get additional diversity of housing or to get, you know, whatever our policy objective is, it could get tied in. But for the most part, that's a separate discussion. It impacts the feasibility overall, whether someone's going to build it or not uh, is part of the equation, but not so much as a tax break for MFTE. But at the end, I think we, we will study each one of these pink things. We can pick which one we want to study and have conversations on, but, but I wouldn't recommend that we make any changes until all of those are fully vetted and understood, and then we change our regulation one time together. Unless through that process we learn that this is an easy thing we can do right away, because they could impact. But the order of studying and having conversations with the community and, and with the PPC could be you know, whatever we choose to, you all to tell us to do. Yeah, so my, my, if I look at this, it seems like we have a whole year of these, a bunch of these conversations, and my, um, and it starts in the middle of next year and goes into the middle of 2025. It seems to me like we have had, a, I, I mean, I recall being in a lot of conversations in the Planning Policy Commission on parking, for example. I think that's something that we have, we have talked a lot about as a community. We. It will be great to have the parking study and a refresh on that, but it's something we've had a lot of consideration on. Uh, similarly, with inclusionary zoning and development regulations, and I think I think also the bonus. But um, I do think multifamily tax exemption. In terms of, you know, there all of these conversations are a ways out, and they're all um, over a long period of time. But in the context of prioritizing things, it seems to me like. Uh, and then also because MFT can be considered separately, having those conversations prioritized might be worth considering. Um, and we and I take the point about taking action, but as it is right now, it's like all the actions occur in 2025, which we could we could advise to prioritize parts of this, and it wouldn't affect that end action. I think. Yeah, I think if I summarize what I heard in terms of prioritization, MFTE and parking are important. So we can start, you know, in the order of the pink, we will study those first. And as those conversations occur with the community and planning and policy commission, we'll bring for, forward. And if there are pieces that can be done earlier, sure, we can get those, you know, adopted first. But our, at this point, we're looking at studying all of those items and then taking action on them. And then the other thing I heard was the housing action, uh, the strategies plan uh, update. There can be reevaluated whether that that's the right time or not. It, we may not learn much doing it so quickly that it may be worth waiting a little bit uh, to see the impact of all the other changes. That's what my takeaway is from your direction. Does that capture? I think that captures my intent. Uh, I'm seeing council president. Uh, no. Well, and I'm just, I'm realizing that, I don't know how to get at this, but basically there's, these strategies go at two kind of types of housing in that 
multifamily tax exemption is going and inclusionary zoning gets you really that affordable housing. Some of the other things, I guess the parking city is also required in order to be effective, cost effective, but it also holds back non affordable housing as well. Um, I don't know, I probably just haven't had enough sleep in order to be able to explain all of this well, but I am I think I'm generally comfortable with all of that. Um, having the missing middle conversation first, I think it's really the most important thing for me, so, yeah. I thought that captured feedback well, too. Um, I did wanna pose this question to committee and staff. So if one of our arguments for maybe saying Maybe we want to wait and evaluate outcome before updating the housing strategy work plan again. Could the same not be said for the central Isquah plan, or are there any other kind of ways that we're thinking about that update? I'm going to look to Stephen for that one, because part of the central Isquah plan, as we talked about earlier, has to do with the regional growth center and the transit center and the recertification there. So I'm not quite sure what that timeline is. The other part uh, for the reasoning for updating the central school plan is also just a follow-up from the Title 18 update. And because we took a lot of what was adopted into the code out of the code, we need to now take another look at the central school plan to see what needs to get uh, fixed, but also with a lot of the work on the middle housing and the pink items on the schedule, it's also going to impact how we're going to be approaching housing and development in the central school. Makes perfect sense. It's okay to say, no, Council Member Hall, that's not the same. <laughs> well, and, and that one are, does start after, I mean, it starts immediately after, but it starts after the other item. So it would be after the code was, my reading is it would be like all these code changes would be adopted in 2025, and then we would do the central escrow plan update. But the housing strategy currently is starting before that, which I think we've all said we think maybe should be reevaluated. Re okay, do you have what you need from us? I do. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, great. Okay, thank you. We have one more item on our agenda this evening ID 1541, Comprehensive Plan Update Draft environment, Environmental Stewardship and Climate. Resilience elements, and this will be presented by Stephen Padua, Long Range Planning Manager. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Chair Hunt. Good evening, everybody. Give me one second as I get my screen share. There we go. Okay. Tonight we're going to discuss the new element in the comprehensive plan, that being the environment stewardship and climate resilience element. This is a brand new element that's required from House Bill um, 1181 that was adopted earlier this year. I'll talk a little bit on um, what was required from that bill. The direction we need tonight are, are there additional considerations the environmental board should be studying prior to finalizing their recommendations to the city council? Are there specific areas around climate and or sustainability where ISCA should take leadership role in terms of goal or policy statements? For land use policy G5, should the city establish stronger language to phase out natural gas as a priority or more as a supporting role of the utility companies in the state? And then lastly, are there any additional topics for staff to consider when making final edits to the draft? So a little background information on this element. The vast majority of the goals and policies um, that were proposed for this element are carryover from the land use element. Um, some of the reason for that is we wanted to tailor this new element around climate change as well as the natural environment. Particularly because it's required by House Bill 1181, we wanted to be able to have the conversations of addressing climate change, addressing climate resilience, addressing greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also around how we're preserving and enhancing the natural environment um, as it's formed in the Climate Action Plan. 
So a lot of the implementation coming out for, um, for this element is going to be through the Climate Action Plan, but uh, also there's going to be implementation addressed through the Mobility Master Plan, the Park System Plan, and a lot of other functional plans that look at the preservation enhancement of the natural environment, as well as climate resilience. The development of this uh, element, uh, the development of this element, and prior to the Planning Policy Commission's review on in October, we've had several conversations with the Environmental Board since April to first look at what we wanted to put into the element, but also look at the individual goals and policies and how we wanted to update those goals and policies with this uh, periodic update. Majority of the recommended changes relate to House Bill 1181. Uh, what we looked at with the land use element, how we wanted to address greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emission reduction and climate resilience, as well as looking at natural disasters and addressing environmental justice throughout the element. The new element is organized um, using this structure. These items are very are, are consistent with how the items are addressed in the Climate Action Plan. So tonight I'm going to be going through each of the goals and policies as they're proposed in uh, the committee's materials. One question I have for you, Chair Hunt, is do you want me to pause after each section for questions or just power through all the slides? I have about 15 slides to get through uh, and then go to questions. Um, <clears throat> typically, in case there is comments, we we uh, we like to have the presentation, and then okay. I will call for, um, or then we'll do questions, and then I will call for that. So okay. to to have that flow, if you could power through, that would be great. Okay, I will. Thank you. So for the first section, we have the greenhouse gas emissions reductions. This is around goal F, uh, general redu reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The majority of uh, or at least the first half of these are actually in the ICAP. The first two policies, F1 and F2, there's proposed no changes for what's proposed or what is in the Climate Action Plan. Policy F3, we had a discussion with the board to introduce new changes to that policy. And then uh, the last four policies are actually new uh, to comply with House Bill 1181 requirements. For the goal area, uh, G, this is specific to transition to renewable energy. Majority of these policies are actually in the ICAP and we're proposing no changes. For the new policy, Z5, this is a new policy that we are introducing uh, changes from the board to address reduction of fossil fuel use in existing buildings. And then I, there is a specific question for policy G5. For goal area H, this is the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions specific to transportation. These, this goal and these policies were actually moved over from the transportation element. That was a requirement of House Bill 1181 to contain the, this goal and or this sub-element of goals and policies in this new element. Uh, the first two policies, B1 and B2, are in the ICAP and are uh, slightly updated to accommodate the 2020. 44 uh, periodic update. The policy B3 is uh, proposed to be removed, and then policy H3 is actually consolidated with the language from policy B3. The board discussed changes to policy H1 uh, on the reliance, decreasing auto reliance. Policy Z6 is a new uh, policy specific to form the requirements from House Bill 1181. And the board discussed changes to policy H2 to promote walking, biking, and short commuting. For goal area I, this is specific to re reduction of waste and materials as it relates to uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. There's no changes proposed for policies I1, 2, and 3. And then policies Z7 and 8 are new policies to comply with House Bill 1181. For the next section, resilience and well-being, we have goal K, 
um, that is specific to cl preparedness for climate emergencies. The board discussed changes to the goal as well as policy K-1. Um, this, these are both in the climate action plan. We also have policy K-2, which is also in the climate action plan, but we updated it to comply with House Bill 1181. Uh, policy Z-9 is new in compliance with House Bill 1181 and addressing community resilience. Uh, we're proposing no changes to policy K-3. Uh, that is in the climate action plan. And policy Z-10 is a new House Bill for complying with House Bill 1181, prioritizing frontline communities. The next section, natural systems and water resources. We have goal, goal area for, or goal J, uh, which is the protection of habitats and resources. Board proposed changes to the goal, uh, mostly to make it less specific and kind of bring it to a higher level of the goals we're establishing for the comprehensive plan. Policy D4, uh, staff updated uh, the language around rechargeability for groundwater. We're consolidating policies D4 and D5, so we're proposing to remove policy D5. Policy J2 has proposed changes uh, from our discussions with Environmental Board. Um, both policies J2 and J3 are actually in the Climate Action Plan. We're not proposing a change to policy J3. Policies Z11 and Z12 are new and staff propose specific to addressing contaminants and how hard services are treated. For the next section, streams, wetlands, and wildlife. We have goal E, which is specific to improvements for fish and wild, wildlife habitat. We're not proposing any changes to policies E1 and 2. We are proposing a minor change to the language on acquiring creek site parcels in policy E3. We are proposing um, a change for policy E4, which was a discussion with the Environmental Board. Then no changes to policies E5 and uh, Policy Z3, C13 is a new policy to comply with House Bill 1181. We also have policy Z14, which is new to uh, address aquatic habitat resilience to comply with House Bill 1181. We split policies A14 into two policies, one to specifically address natural drainage practices and to call out the green necklace as its own policy. Uh, within this section. And lastly, we're, uh, we have the last policy, Z15, is to improve fish habitat. And this is carryover from the land use element. Next section on trees, we have goal B, specific to establishing the citywide tree canopy. We discussed changes with the board of how to uh, word that goal. Um, policy J1 has no proposed changes, but is established in the Climate Action Plan. We proposed a change with policy B1. Um, staff introduced updates to the language to add clarity of exactly what the intent of the policy is. And then policy Z16 is a new policy to comply with House Bill 1181. And with all the elements in the comprehensive plan, we have our results and accountability section, which will establish implementation and monitoring of all the elements. Where we're at with the schedule is we're still working through the analysis, having the board discussions on goals and policies, and bringing proposed changes to the council committee. Next steps uh, from this point is we're going to the Mobility Infrastructure Committee in December to talk about transportation utilities and the capital facilities element. We'll be bringing the SEPA scope and economic vitality element to this committee in January. And then we'll be going to the Safety Services and Parks Committee in February to talk about the parks, human services, and cultural element. And that brings us back to the direction we need for tonight. All right, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we will move into committee Q and A. Um, I have one. I have one starting question. 
So on the, the question that you asked about uh, LU policy G5, um, which is very specific, have there been conversations at the environmental board about that already? And could you please summarize those? Or what, what's, the, um, what's the background on why that's a specific question for us this evening? This policy is called out because we have actually had several conversations with the environmental board on how we want to um, word this language for this policy on the city being a leadership. So similar to the uh, previous question on the, the city's role in uh, being a leader in the region uh, and amongst our uh, peers is, do we want to take a, have stronger language on phasing out natural gas or do we just primarily want to coordinate with utility companies who already have a goal and policies around phasing out natural gas? Okay, and can you summarize um, the, it, has there been a consensus from the environmental board on wanting this to be stronger from their perspective or what was the consensus of those conversations? I'm gonna call on my colleagues in the sustainability department to help me with uh, the consensus. Hello, council members. Um, I'm David Reedy, the sustainability coordinator with the city and I'm joined here with Kathleen Hillary, our Civic Spark fellow. Um, so just as a little bit more background on this policy, um, this is a policy from the Climate Action Plan. Um, it was accidentally, or it was, it didn't make it into the uh, comp plan when the rest of the ICAP uh, policies uh, were added um, a few years ago. So this one was kind of um, accidentally lost off, uh, left off. Um, so it's being added in now. Um, and this policy comes directly from the King County Climate Collaborative, K4C, um, joint agreement policies. So this is consistent. This policy as written is consistent with uh, their policies. Um, as to uh, consensus among the environmental board, I think generally uh, the environmental board is uh, in favor of strengthening, uh, strengthening uh, these policies where able. Um, so I, I think there's some questions as to kind of to what degree we could strengthen that um, and kind of push for push further. But um, I think the environmental board had wanted us to, to look for, for opportunities to, to lead there. Okay. Um, so I think the first thing we just wanted to check, it would be great to check what, if any, uh, was in the comp plan previously when the ICAP, because I, yeah, that's what we were looking at each other about. Um, our, my understanding was that the, those sorts of policies did all make it in, so I'm very actually surprised about that, and I just want to just get the backgrounds there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I was actually curious about that earlier today, so I looked. I, I, thought, I, I thought I read it when I did control F in our current <laughs> comp plan. So maybe that is a bit of it. That could be something I could look into. Um, my, from everything I've seen kind of for the, the um, what we've been looking at for moving things over to the environmental element, um, this one had not been included, um, but I can double check that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I think uh, in terms of this, so it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, sounds like there have been conversations they're interested in strengthening from the current language, which is in our packet, and it um, says, advanced building decarbonization and ensure ISQA is on track to meet state goals and requirements by shifting from natural gas to electricity and all new and existing buildings. So it seems to me that, you know, it's it's basically saying that we should meet state goals and sounds like the uh, environmental board is interested in changing from that. Is that correct? But not a specific change. Um, the other thing is I think that there is more specific, I'm fairly sure there is more specific language in the ICAP about like targets for that decarbonization. So would would that be a way to strengthen? Was that considered as a way to, you know, be more specific in this goal? Um, 
Yeah, and, and I apologize. Um, policy G5, it was, um, before I'd been uh, talking a little bit about the reduced fossil fuel use, so um, the new policies, I think, Z5. Um, so there are specific actions called out in the climate action plan mm -hmm. that would help us kind of advance the building decarbonization. Um, so, you know, uh, that would include things like regional heat pump campaigns, decarbonization assessments, things like that. Um, advancing uh, other electrification incentive programs. Um, so there are some some actions called out, um, and I think part of the, the question is uh, to what degree um, do we want to, yeah, be more, more ambitious there. Okay, so um, there, so, my understanding is the current wording is probably at least less specific than what's in the ICAP for this particular element. And then there's conversations about making it stronger than the ICAP. Um, I, I, just to clarify. Okay, so um, I think that those are the questions. Those, those were my only questions. Do we have any other questions? Councilmember Member Hall. I have two questions, one that's, um, Specific and one that's very, very broad. Um, so apologies for not emailing that broad one in earlier. You're just going to have to respond to whatever comes to mind. Um, but first, just with like the recent uh, power outages, got me thinking a lot about like grid rely, energy grid reliability too. And I'm wondering if, if that needs to live as a goal somewhere or a policy somewhere in here to work with utilities to ensure reliability. What are your what's your reaction? We do have policies in the utilities element that actually looks at grid reliability and working with our utility companies on uh, different infrastructure needs. So when uh, this comes to me on the mobility and infrastructure, you're saying we could talk about it there. Okay. Potentially. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Um, and the other is, so one of the direction needed questions is, you know, what are the areas that we should take a leadership role in? And so my initial reaction was, what are the areas that we feel capable of leading in? Or um, like, what are we well equipped to take on here in the ISQA given our capacity needs, given community interests, that kind of thing? It, that's kind of a, also has policy implications. So it's like half a policy question, but also half of like a resourcing and interesting or an interest question from the staff side. So I'm just kind of curious what your initial reaction to that would be and, and we can kind of further develop onto. I'll provide a very broad response and then I'll ask David to kind of chime in on the more specifics. But I believe a lot of the discussions on where the city can take a leadership role was discussed in the development of the Climate Action Plan. And there's a lot more specifics in there of what our capabilities are locally as well as what we can do regionally and with partnerships, working with King County or even the state on expanding on different areas. And then David, is there anything specific yeah, I think when we think about other kind of leadership opportunities for the city, um, you know, a lot of my specific work is with municipal operations, right? So we could, for instance, think about leadership in, um, you know, fleet electrification, for instance, um, where we want to be, you know, different fleets are approaching it in different ways. Fleets want to make sure that the technology works for them and for the needs of the different um, vehicles um, that we're trying to employ. Um, but within, you know, fleet electrification or say um, municipal building decarbonization, there's the opportunity to kind of put more uh, ambitious targets, more, uh, yes, funding and, and support towards those uh, those efforts that could have us lead regionally, um, regionally or um, statewide or, or whatnot. Um, so I think there's definitely kind of on the municipal side some, some opportunities there. Um, and then I think uh, continuing on kind of the community side of things, right, we have, we are leading the state with um, a heat pump program with the other east side cities. Um, but I think there's, again, kind of opportunities to uh, continue to lead around um, other 
incentive programs, electrification programs, things along those lines that um, are being trialed across the country, but uh, you know there hasn't been kind of one uh, set model that everyone knows works perfectly yet, and so uh, different jurisdictions are are kind of figuring it out as they go. President Walsh. Um, so when we're talking about this land use policy G5 and language about phasing out natural gas, can you, and I emailed the question in earlier about what the state's role is in that, because I know we have a new building code that is in the works that was supposed to be implemented and is delayed. Can you talk through what the effects of that would be and is that part of the consideration where if the environmental board is if the environmental board is talking about you know should we consider stronger language is it stronger than even what the state building code is going to look at or you know how how does that relate to the state building code and natural gas phase out? Yeah, great question. So um, I think when we think about kind of decarbonizing our buildings, um, at least in my mind, I'm, I'm kind of splitting them into the two buckets, the new buildings and the existing buildings, right? It both are taking different levers, right? Um, so for the new buildings, if the state energy code is adopted, um, then that will uh, lead to, to meaningful and um, significant decarbonization for new buildings, right? That'll require, for the most part, um, all uh, electrification of new buildings. Um, existing buildings are uh, a little bit more complicated, right? Um, there are pieces of that new energy code that would actually impact existing buildings as equipment gets replaced. Um, there are there would be requirements for kind of electrifying some older equipment depending on the size of the new equipment you're putting in. Um, and then likewise, there's the um, clean building performance standard, um, which is impacting all buildings over 20,000 square feet um, and setting kind of energy use targets and um, energy efficiency uh, targets for those buildings. So I think between those two laws and then also the Clean uh, Energy Transformation Act, right? That's shifting our electricity, the renewable sources. That's gonna also be, of course, impacting our electric, um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with electric use. So between all of those, um, that does kind of get at most of our uh, buildings, new and existing. Um, but I think the idea is that they're kind of those other programs and opportunities such as heat pumps and uh, heat pump programs and, and things like that and other ways that we can kind of augment our um, building codes or Title 18 things to, to support that. And Title 18 was just um, updated, so not suggesting we update that right now, but um, there are some meaningful um, efforts made there. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is while this section definitely talks about phasing out natural gas and you know all of that there's a lot happening at the state level that if the building code does get adopted that will have a big impact on new buildings we've got the clean buildings uh, initiative act whatever it is uh, for buildings over 20,000 square feet we've also got a lot coming on potentially if you're making bigger changes to existing homes that would move you toward electrification but there's some areas in that that we could go further as far as incentivizing heat pumps or other um, electrification. And potentially, we have this whole other section related to our municipal buildings as well. Does that summarize the landscape? Yes, I think that generally summarizes okay, the landscape. That's very helpful. Thank you. Hall. 
Um, I just found the answer to my question on the website. Never mind. And you know, I, I was going to ask. Um, this, I've, you're asking a question about like where we should lead, and I just made me think of the lead gold certified that we had. So uh, some of our opportunities for improvement, maybe we can align that with where we should be leading to, um, because we had a report card. So do you happen to remember off the top of your head, like what were kind of some of the two or three major opportunities improvement that we have there? <laughs> Thanks. Do you want to answer? Or? I can, so our top three priority actions that came out of that um, were, the, there were kind of sections that we didn't do as good, um, and then there were kind of three priority actions we identified. So one of them was to do um, lighting retrofits, LED lighting um, throughout the um, city lights. Um, the second was to rethink how we're doing um, waste staffing. Um, at the city, and then the third was to look at um, water, water conveyance infrastructure, and think about kind of how we're um, opportunities for smart metering and kind of some of these other ad advanced technologies around um, water infrastructure. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions? Um, right, then at this time, I will call for public comment. We have no members of the public in the audience, and I will check in if there are any members of the public online that might want to give comments. Chair Hunt, we do have a member of the public in attendance online, but they have not indicated a desire to speak. Okay, all right. Um, then we will move to our discussion on this item. Um, Council President Walsh. So my first reaction in looking at all of this is, oh my gosh, this is a lot. And then when I look back at how many environmental board meetings, and as somebody who came up through PPC, I know that you can really get into the wording on that and talk about what the intent is. And so uh, the first step there, I just want to say thank you so much to the environmental board for doing that um, work, because ultimately, and staff, that did it. Uh, ultimately, um, what I see there is a lot of really good changes that I think really meet the needs of our community. So I'm feeling really good about the general proposed changes in there. Um, as far as where we should lead, I mean, I'd like to see us lead on municipal buildings and um, fleet, and I think those, the areas that are in our control are great. They're expensive, but they're great. Um, and similarly, I think the heat pump campaign has been really interesting and a really great way to tie in equity with major changes that are needed um, that help us get toward our goals. So the more of that we can do, the better. Um, from my perspective, as far as land use policy G5, um, I, I really like the new state building code. Um, and I think it provides a great opportunity for us to move together hand in hand with our neighboring cities. Um, so if that can be accomplished, I'm super happy. But I think the question mark still in the air is, is that going to be challenged? Um, and so the question I think should probably go back to the environmental board is to get a sense of whether they want us to move beyond what the state building code would kind of adopt and move everybody toward, or whether that sense of new building electrification plus what's happening with the Clean Buildings mm -hmm. Act and all of that, whether that gets us where we want to go without splintering off as separate cities. Um, because I do have some concerns about that. 
So that would be my general approach to that. I think we should absolutely be moving hugely in that direction, but we should also respect the work that's happened on the state level that could get us all there together. So those are my thoughts. I, I had one question, sorry, that I didn't ask this during the question time. Um, so the uh, the riparian is a very specific question. The green necklace is in the riparian corridor um, section, and it has it, it talks about like making sure that we have green necklace in the riparian corridors. Is that because it's covered elsewhere already in the code? The other places where the green necklace is, because the green necklace would not only be in the riparian corridors. So just like make, basically making sure it's in that section, but it's already in the, the part about parks and the part about okay, and yeah, the no, community exactly spaces it. and okay. Okay. Um, that was my one question. Thank you. Uh, all right. So um, firstly, I uh, appreciated the PPD um, comments. So there's a comment there. There's a new uh, provision about making sure that we are filtering out PPD, which is known, um, I may have the acronym wrong. 6 PPD, Six PPD yeah. Q um, and PFOS is also in that same one, but um, that's a very important thing for salmon to be, um, that's the, the fire dust. Um, and so I was, I searched for that, I did command F and found it and I appreciate that. Um, and that is based on staff suggestions, so thank you for that. Uh, like Council President Walsh, very, very happy with the amount of work and thought that has clearly gone into this, so thank you um, for all of that. And also thank you to our commissions, our volunteer commissions for all of their work making this so comprehensive. Um, as far as the questions that we were asked, I think that we have this environmental board for the purpose of providing recommendations. And so it doesn't sound like, it sounded like there was conversation, but there wasn't a specific recommendation on this item for policy G5, um, so that would really be the one that I would ask to, for them to make a recommendation if they can come to a consensus on it. Uh, the policy that's in there was in the comp plan already, um, so I have to think that they want something different than that. Um, and it's the same wording as in the ICAP for that, for G5. It's already there. Um, and so I have to think that they want something stronger. The one one thing that uh, they could consider in that conversation is there are a number of uh, sections in the ICAP under that heading, um, actually one of which is about grid resilience, uh, to Council Member Hall's earlier comment. Um, but we could consider strengthening it by incorporating those into the policy, like those things that we're going to do. There's some more information about the, the targets um, and, the, and the heat pump campaign, for example. So uh, at, the, at the very least, it seems we could make sure that we better explain our strategy to strengthen it, um, to strengthen that. And then if they have another recommendation as far as changing the, the wording, I think that would be great to hear from them so we can consider it. Um, that would be my ask. Uh, I'm generally supportive of the ICAP, and you know, there's been a huge amount of work that went into that, and we established this environmental board to provide recommendations. So if they if they are advocating for some stronger language or clear clarifying the uh, clarifying and making sure that all of the ICAP is captured in the comprehensive plan, I would just basically like to know that and would definitely consider it. And absolutely, we know this community is very concerned about climate change and it is already impacting us and so I'm I'm in favor of considering that stronger language and would just like to have that proposal so we can consider it for next time. Um, let's see. A leadership role, the second question, specific areas around the leadership role. I did note that there is in the matrix, um, oh, now I couldn't find it. I think that it does already talk about leading yeah, lead by example for municipal operations such as fleet buildings and waste, among other opportunities, which was from the ICAP. Um, I think it's a great suggestion to just look at where we already know we are leaders from the LEED Gold certification. 
as well, but um, I think leading by example in those areas that we are that are in our control, the council president Walsh's comment earlier is a good good thing. Um, and and yeah, the the areas where we're also a, a, a force of con a convening force, like with the heat pump campaign, those are also great. I think to to mention whether it's mentioned as the in the lead by example or in the um, building decarbonization. I can I think could fit in either, but either way. Um, yeah, I had. Um, so those are my big comments. I had a couple comments which I think will probably be clarified once we actually get the wording of these, but for example, there's a revised goal policy about reducing waste generation by promoting a circular economy. I know that that's proposed to comply with the house, a house bill, but it does seem like um, that that one and a couple other ones are a little bit vague, um, so those might also be things that at some point we could have the environmental board consider, you know, like what does it mean to promote a circular economy? Uh, that would be helpful to know. Does that mean we promote the reuse of the, um, the waste oil from the restaurants? I know that's one part of a circular economy, or, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> so I think um, for those those new ones that are proposed to comply with HB 1110, because we don't have the official draft document, um, maybe when the draft document comes back to us, we could have some more clarity on, like, on, for example, that one. There are a few others that are a little bit, it would be a little bit unclear to, to me as a policymaker how to actually achieve that one from the wording. Um, those are my comments. Council Member Hall. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for doing all this, having to pull everything out of all the different elements into a new, <laughs> brand new element must have been um, challenging. Um, I see these first few questions kind of linked for me. Um, I would love to see potentially the environmental board look at the overlap between the lead goal certification report card essentially that we got and opportunities for leadership and improvement um, and lead where, not necessarily where we're already leaders, but where we need to grow. So it seemed like the biggest one that overlapped with this element was the waste diversion policies. So I would love to know what they think about that. And I think it would that would be great thing to be looking for here in Issaquah. Um, I'm also not seeing a whole lot of changes from uh, any of those kind of materials and consumptions goals. Um, and like like was said, some of them are kind of kind of vague too. So I wonder if maybe even just kind of a deep look at those um, would be would be beneficial. Um, with regard to the third question about G5, I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in what they think. I don't know if there's necessarily a need to be bolder or stronger, but potentially more specific. Um, and, and, I, and I say that for a couple of reasons that, you know, it'll help us understand what success looks like for that policy, but also when we adopted the Climate Action Plan, there were actually some last minute voices who were concerned about this particular goal, the business community in particular. And our response was, this is a guiding vision, right? When we start to get closer to like implementing these kinds of things, there will be intense community engagement. So perhaps, um, perhaps it would even be better to be more specific or in that goal and say something like uh, incentivize the transition or um, guiding or supporting the transition in the community or something like that. So if they, if they have a conversation about that that would be helpful. I don't know if I'll leave it up to you if you think it's necessary to take that to like the, the Economic Vitality Commission or if that's something we can kind of think through ourselves and engage with business leaders. But that just came to mind when I saw that one as well. Um, those are. 
the remaining comments. I didn't see anything that I disagreed actively. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any other comments? I think, I think we all were on the same page. Do you have what you need from us on these questions? Yes, we do, Chair Hunt. Great, okay. Um, with that then, thank you again. Thank you all for all of your hard work on this. Um, and with that, we have the final item is announcements. Do we have any announcements? No announcements, okay. Then we are adjourned at 8.05 p.m. Thank you all.